Siti, proceed please. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the centenary celebration of Department of Mechanical Engineering, IIST Shipkot. Before you, this is Siddhi Suman, a third year undergraduate student of this institute and host for this evening. Today, we all are here for the 33rd lecture under the centenary lecture series, which is to be delivered by our honorable guest, Dr. Shudip Bhattacharji on the topic, Vehicle Design for Crashworthiness. This session will be chaired by our distinguished alumnus, Dr. Nihar Vishwas, who is distinguished professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at University of Windsor. I would like to invite Dr. Nihar Vishwas, sir, for the further continuation of the program. Sir. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, Siddhi. Thanks very much. Um, Today we have a real treat, I would say, that we have amongst us uh, Dr. Sudip Bhattacharji. Uh, he is a, a graduate of Buet, which is in Bangladesh, and uh, he's a gold medalist there. And from there he did his uh, master's as well, and then he was a lecturer at Buet. And then he came, uh, I think he graduated I forget the year, 1990 something, I forget now. But then he came to McGill uh, in Canada where he did his PhD and then he was doing his postdoc when I successfully located him and invited him to become a faculty member at the University of Windsor. And here he stayed for a couple of years and then Ford Motor Company across the river uh, found out his expertise in, in vehicle, not vehicle, but dynamics, solid mechanics, dynamics, numerical methods, finite element analysis, and all this, and they took him away, basically. But anyway, he, he's, still teaching at, he's still teaching at the University of Windsor, and uh, he's a very valuable member of our faculty, and uh, particularly our uh, graduate program, master's and PhD program. And uh, he's here now today, and he's going to talk about the crashworthiness engineering in general. And uh, it's over to you, uh, Dr. Sudip Bhattacharji. Dr. Bhattacharji, you're on. Thank you, Niharda. If I may add to this introduction, um, I grew up in a village in Bangladesh, and I was always hearing in the village that somebody went to Shippur to learn engineering during the British India time, and he came back as a madman or a pagal. And he had a miserable end of life in the village. So I started my memory with uh, Shippur, as you can understand, with a big fear. And as a student, I learned about Dr. F. R. Khan, who was a great uh, structural engineer in the whole world in 1960s or 70s. So I started to develop this respect and admiration for your institute. I never had the opportunity to interact with uh, the community except that Niharda, I knew him personally. I knew Dr. Pranab Saha, who is also online. So it is my great honor to be really associated with your distinguished community here. It's really, really a great honor, starting from my you know, childhood memory of fear and admiration, as I already mentioned. So I am really, uh, really honored and thankful for having me here. Uh, so let's get started. I hope you can uh, see my screen. So the topic is vehicle design for crashworthiness. And the question is, uh, what qualifies me to talk about this topic? So as uh, Niharda mentioned, uh, as profession, I basically work in that area, vehicle design or engineering for crashworthiness. And my passion is occasional graduate teaching at the universities in the US and Canada. So with that combination of profession and passion, I developed some kind of proficiency in structural design solutions for finite element method. So this is the combination of, you can say, my background and my profession that I'm going to bring to uh, you here, the presentation, I broke it down in three segments. 
why do we design a vehicle for crashworthiness and how to measure really crashworthiness and particularly for the students if anybody is there i heard at least one student who introduced us if there is any other student there might be wondering what does it take to get into this profession if anyone is interested so that will be the third part just highlighting some of the key technical proficiency areas that we look at please feel free to interrupt me any time or ask questions i don't have any agenda to finish here so we can stop anywhere when the time really runs out so i would like it to be more interactive than just you know a monologue so please feel free to ask any question whatever i'm going to speak here is available in public domain there is no copyright material or there is no confidential material from my employer employer neither does it reflect their design practices with that so we start from a high level look of what is the global mortality as you know in the world of statistics every death is a mechanical reason there is nothing called a natural death so there are many mechanical reasons why a life ends and if you look into today's uh, ranking it used to be ninth in 2004 data and now it has climbed up to 7 or 8 and the projection is that road traffic death or fatality is going to rise to fifth position if you rank it by proportion now this is just the you know statistics of proportion if you look at the number roughly 1.3 million deaths on the roads globally in the world and as you some of you mentioned already you know 10% of it or 11% of it comes from india alone so that's a pretty big number looking at the different regions of the world how do these things happen it doesn't happen always the same way if we look into some of the countries particularly high density cities with mixed mode of transportation 50% of more deaths happen with the vulnerable road users where is in the other extreme where i live or near the live we have very few people on the road to go and hit to hit on to but we do have a large proportion of the deaths happening in the private transportation vehicles we can go a little more deeper into the region specific data so starting from far east japan and korea in those countries you will see about a third in the motor vehicle population drivers and passengers but you will have about two third of the deaths happening with the vulnerable population that are on the road particularly pedestrians and cyclists who get into the collision with the automotive products coming to the eastern asia thailand malaysia as you see now it is a disproportionate representation a very high representation coming from the two and three wheeler riders and it is understandable because if somebody gets into an accident with on a two wheeler there is very little available resource available for the protection of the person particularly when it is very severe coming to what i call the center of the world because that's where you have 2 plus billion people in china and india motor vehicle deaths about or less than 20% 15% in india 19% in china india data is just the release data for 2021 and if you see the other vulnerable areas they represent also a pretty good number so here is the situation in india as you see two wheeler riders they represent not exactly half but close to half of the deaths on the road then you have pedestrian and all other things and motor vehicle riders they represent 15% of the death now any one single death is really unfortunate but if you look in the proportion the big problems are outside of the motor vehicle let's put it that way now going towards the west netherlands and germany etc as you can see about half of the deaths are related to the vulnerable road users and less than half with the motor vehicle riders coming to north america we we have about half or no, sorry not just half not just driver if you combine the driver and the passengers two third of the fatalities are with motor vehicle drivers and about 30% with the vulnerable road users so basically priorities are different in different parts of the world and that's why the regulations and design efforts are also done to meet the need of the society and the market and 
we as engineers, we try to solve the problem that is assigned to us. Now, death is only one part. If you look into the big picture, so death is what is called the tip of the iceberg. You have millions of other incidences happening with billions and billions of dollars of impact on the society for everything else that happens on the roads. So no wonder the traffic incidences and the deaths, they get high attention in the society almost everywhere. United Nations has its whole effort under the World Health Organization. They publish a report every year, every year or close to being every year. So they also try to influence the policymakers uh, in different countries to pay attention to the big issues. They have two focus. One is the looking into the transportation system itself, the infrastructure, the roads and traffic laws and etc. the enforcement, uh, the emergency support system, all these things. But they also highlight the vehicles. And this particular report that I'm referring to, it's like 80% of all the vehicles that are sold in different countries have some kind of safety defect, which I have some question about because uh, Safety is not one absolute thing that applies to all over the world, as you have already seen the data. Different markets have different priorities and different needs. But nonetheless, they try to make a global summary of the problems from all different parts of the world. And then they try to list the desired safety features in the vehicles. And if you see in their list, one to probably eight, seven of them are in different technological features or design features they are listing for the vehicle. So I always ask this question, can vehicle safety features alone solve the global problem? I don't think I want to answer the question, but I leave the question for you all to answer. Once you look into your own regional data, your country specific data, and you may come to your own conclusion about what to do to solve the problems. Now, looking into, again, the different parts proportionately, and this data is showing the um, so rating of the data per 100,000 population per year. So starting from North America to Europe, and then coming to what I call, again, the center of the world, the ratio is probably about 10 to 1, or in some cases, even higher. So the number of people getting killed on the road, for whatever reason, and there are many reasons, is very, very high in the big population area and they carry the bulk of the, you can say, unfortunate incidences in the whole world. So what we need to solve these big problems is probably more than just the vehicle safety feature. And we already talked about different regions and different priorities and vehicle safety feature alone cannot solve the problem. And this is just an example. I took this picture from the internet and there are reports often you will see in different parts of the result, uh, different parts of the world, vehicles carrying people in the cargo area or over, you know, loaded people uh, inside the vehicle, like in my village, when they get into really some kinds of accidents, you end up getting large number of deaths as well. So not only the vehicle safety feature we need to focus on, we also need to focus on the societal practice. That how are we dealing with a vehicle how are we using it and what can we do? So my focus is obviously not on all these general topics, but I just bring it to your attention that problem is spread in many different areas of the society. Here again, a snapshot of the data, again, it is coming from India. And this 2021 data, they try to also summarize based on the police report, I believe, that what were the causes of those accidents? And if I sum up over speeding, then dangerous or you can say careless driving and the driving under the influence of drug and alcohol. If I sum up those three things, I call these are the human errors and that represent more than 80%, 85% of the incidences. So it's a very big proportion. And in the US it is 95%. We'll have that data later. Now, obviously speed is a big factor as you are seeing. And, but, but speed alone is not always the issue. There are other factors with it. For example, at a younger age, people are probably lacking the experience and then prone to taking more risk. So they represent much higher risk. And obviously at an old age, 
we tend to lose agility. So we also lose some perception of the speed and then, and then surroundings. They also carry high risk. And then in between, obviously, everybody else. So in summary, the first and the foremost thing we must always do, use seat belts. We should not question where I'm sitting in the front seat or rear seat, and if there is a law to use the uh, seat belt if I'm sitting in the rear seat. That question should not be even asked at all. Everybody must always use the seat belt if the person is in the vehicle. And obviously those who are driver, they must pay attention, don't drink and drive and slow down, just a few general stuff. Since I also talk at the universities among the students, I tend to share this slide just to you know, bring alertness among those young minds. So with that, maybe I can just pause here before going to the technical stuff. If any of you would like to make any comment or any ask any question. Any question, anybody? No? Okay, Dr. Bhattacharji, you can proceed, yeah. All right, so we talked about the importance of vehicle crushworthiness. It is going to solve probably a fraction of the problem that you are seeing in the world. If you have a vehicle that has been well-designed up to a certain limit, obviously we cannot make an absolute safe vehicle for all kinds of uncertain issues that happen on the road. But we try to do few things or minimum things that we can do based on the best knowledge we have. And this is what we are going to just uh, highlight here, that how do we really measure this crashworthiness? So looking at the US data, 96% of the incidences happen with the passengers cars and the light trucks. Obviously not always the people inside the vehicle are affected, also people outside the vehicle could be affected, but 96% of the incidences happen with basically private use vehicles, either it's a car or an SUV or a light truck. So most of our effort is focused on those products to make them what we call as crash worthy as we can. Just giving little more of the data, and these are the new research data, but new doesn't mean that, uh, you know, only this year. This is the new thinking. When you look into the causes of those incidences, and this is again coming from five years of uh, crash worthiness data or crash incidence data that are there. Every year, US has a lot of data published, and they looked into those particular five years. Identified the critical reasons that led to those incidences. And if you read through those causes, and they represent 94% of all the incidences on the road. And most of these things are preventable if we knew how to do it. So technology is going in this direction. How about we take the human completely out of this driving scenario and give the car or auto auto automation to the car to take us safely from point A to point B? Do we know that the automation will avoid these kinds of accidents and deaths? That question is not answered clearly, but that thought is there. So right now, this is where the industry is trying to go. So if you look into, you can say, last 70 years or 70 plus years of history in the US particularly, because they are the ones who are getting affected in those early time of automotive introduction, and they started to look into this problem very early. So it started with the passive safety like seat belts and airbags and et cetera. It evolved into some advanced driver assistance technology use like electronic uh, you know, emergency braking systems and alert system, et cetera. And now the thought is to go to some sort of automation, may not be full automation, but some sort of automation of the vehicle, particularly in the emergency situation. So this is how the industry is evolving at this time. The forecast by 2025, we may see some autonomous vehicles on the road, or maybe a little bit later, because this report was con compiled several years ago. So my focus here is not to you know, talk about those advancements in autonomous driving and et cetera. They're still an evolving field. And as I said, we don't know yet what benefit it will bring, but we know that 94 or 95% of the accident causes are related to human error. So idea will be to minimize that error with 
with the addition of technology. But I can focus more on here on the passive design of vehicle crashworthiness. Like if a vehicle gets into an accident, what do you do with the engineering to you can say, reduce the risk to the affected person? Just a snapshot of different kinds of requirements that are there in different parts of the world. There are probably more regulations than the number of parts in a vehicle. Regulations are there in anything and everything in the vehicle for its safety. We cannot just count all of them, but we can summarize them in different groups. And we have standard test methods to go and assess the crashworthiness of the vehicle. So I can give an example, but before I go to the example, I just want to tell you, not all the requirements are mandatory. There are some requirements, these are basically defined by regulation, like FMVSS, CMVSS, et cetera. And I know that India also has its own regulations. If we want to sell a vehicle in the market, we must meet that regulation, otherwise you cannot sell the vehicle. Then there are a whole more bunch of requirements, which you call the public domain regulation uh, requirements. These are voluntary, but under competition, the car manufacturers will try to match those as well. So some of those are driven by insurance uh, agencies and institutes like United States Highway Insurance and uh, Insurance Institute of, for Highway Safety. Then we have German, UK, China, and there is also this Research Council for Automotive Repairs is a global agency looking after all these issues. Then we have a whole scale of assessments by different agencies called New Car Assessment Programs or NCAP. Obviously, US is the one who started many years ago, Japan, China, Korea, Europe, Asian, uh, Latin America, India, global NCAP. So we have all these things to take care of. So as you see, there are so many of these different requirements. They vary widely among different regions, but I won't say they really, you know, very widely. There are certain synergies and similarities, but there are also a lot of dissimilarities from different regions, depending on their priorities. We understand that markets are not all same, their priorities are not all same. So when there is a question being asked, why is such and such vehicle exported to some countries have some safety features, whereas some cars in different countries have a different set of safety features. So probably you as a technical community will understand that a manufacturer deals with widely varying requirements in different markets and making everything common is challenging. Even United Nations have been trying under their umbrella to harmonize some of these requirements globally, but after decades of their uh, international trips and hotel meetings, there are only few regulations that are harmonized. So it is not an easy task to make one vehicle same all over the world. That's the bottom line message I'd like to share with you here. So just giving an example, what do those regulations really do to us, to the engineers? So here's a video that I'm just collecting from US government agency website. They're crushing this vehicle to the front. Vehicle has the sensors that is deploying the airbag, pulling on the seat belts, and trying to minimize the injury risk to these dummy models, anthropomorphic dummy, basically instrumented bo mechanical bodies that we use to collect data. So we engineers basically work on all these things. We work on the structures, work on what we call the restraint systems, to protect the occupants, and we also have a bunch of sensors to sense what kind of incidence is happening, how severe it is, and what to do about it. By the way, crash test data, if you are interested, you can always go to the US government website. And since US government, many of the things are done by public money, so they are under obligation to share everything that they do in the public. And by virtue of that, it is available to the whole world which is uh, it's an exceptional thing offered by the US uh, agency, which is not same for the rest of the world. I don't see the similar data with any other agency anywhere in the world, but with the US government agency, anything and everything is visible to the whole world. All right, so uh, what do we do really for those uh, measurements? For example, we have a dummy instrumented mechanical body. We 
put different instruments in different parts of the body and we collect a bunch of data. Then we basically process all this data to come up with a combined probability of severe injury in that scenario. And this is supplemented by some biomechanical injury risk curves that comes through the research for different human bodies. So combining all the data and all this, uh, you can say the reference data, we come up with a combined probability of severe injury. And if that combined probability of severe injury is less than 10%, then the vehicle is five star or is you know gradually decreasing four star, three star, one star, et cetera. So that gives you an idea of how the star rating is done in a vehicle. And we are talking about only one mode here. And there are many different modes to take care of. It could be in the front impact, the example I showed. It could be in the side impact. And no one mode has only a single test. Every mode also has many different tests. It could be vehicle to vehicle rear impact. Or it could be an impact and the crushing coming from the roof. So there are many different modes to do the assessment for. And there are also assessment downs on the vehicle exterior for a pedestrian impact. And for different parts of the pedestrian body, we have different impactors to apply at a different speed and mass and make an assessment of the vehicle exterior. So I just try to give you a flavor with very few examples of how the assessment is done for vehicle crush or thinness. We have crush test or impactors in different modes of the vehicle as well as to the exterior of the vehicle to take care of many of these different requirements. Again, to summarize, not all requirements are same in all the countries in the world. There are some similarities, but I would say mostly dissimilar. And we, the engineers, we juggle with all these things to make our product as safe as we can wherever it is being sold. So the next part, and I think we have ample time left, unless we want to again pause here for a few seconds to see if there is any question or comment. Sure. Is there any question or, or, or comment? Anybody? I have a quick question, Dr. Yes. Bhattacharji. Yeah, so when you do this the very last slide when we had the dummies, being, yeah, right. So you normalize the body weight and the height and all those things for, so you have a standard for that? Yes, so uh, maybe I also step back to the previous slide or here. So there is a lot of research done by the biomechanics community and also the government agencies. They come up with the standard definition of, you can say, human body models or mechanical models. So they look into the demography of the population of a country and then they say, this is an instrument for fifth percentile population. Then they will have another definition for 50th percentile population. Then they will have another one for 95th percentile population. Okay. And for those different dummies, and there are also some child dummies and et cetera. Mm -hmm. Then obviously there will be a lot of research and to figure out what is the injury risk for a certain measurement for those different dummy sizes. So all these things are defined in those standards and regulations. And we, the engineering community, manufacturing community, we just follow their standard and we try to do the best we can. Okay, good. Thank same, you. Yeah, yeah, same thing goes also now for pedestrian. Oh, by the way, not all the dummies are same. Like there are dedicated dummies or instrumented bodies for front impact, the same thing for side impact and the rear impact, etc. So you have different sets of instrumental dummies for different crush modes. Okay. And then when it goes to pedestrian, again, the similar kind of research and they came up with standard definition for the lag impactor in terms of its mass and construction and measurements, the femur uh, area or the pelvis area, and then different heads, like a child head with a, a child body with a smaller stature will have a child head impact span, and then an adult head impact will go over a different zone of the vehicle. So again, these are all defined in standards. Okay, great. All right. Thank you, please uh, Please proceed, yeah. So the last segment of the presentation here, we probably still have pretty good 20 minutes or so left. 
but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this technical description, but I'm only going to highlight the critical skills we look at. Since, as I mentioned, some of the students may be listening to this conversation and they may be wondering what engineering skills are required, particularly in my profession where I work. So I'm just going to highlight some of the key features in our engineering world. And many of these things, as you will see, these are basic engineering techniques that we all learn in the universities. We are not really inventing any new theory or any new uh, say, process here. We are just using the basic engineering skills. But using some of this basic engineering skill, as you can imagine, is challenging once you face the real world problems. And that's what we're going to highlight here. So this schematic, what it is showing, we have a vehicle. And the spring is representing, you can say, a structure in the front. We have some sensors in the front of the vehicle, inside the vehicle, and also in the surrounding of the vehicle. And this schematic is showing the vehicle starts with an initial velocity of V0. It is going to have an impact against a rigid object. So we deal with certain amount of kinetic energy, and which is basically half mv squared. So mass of the vehicle is a critical parameter. And the bigger, heavier the vehicle, more challenging the task is for engineer to manage all these things. Now, if I just go back and forth during the event, what is happening, the vehicle which is was here, say reference time zero, now it has moved to a certain distance because there is some space that we can squeeze out what we call the crush space. So as we crush the vehicle, our objective is to bring the velocity of the entire vehicle down to zero. That's the first step. But we have to do it within the space that we have available. We cannot just go and crash into the compartment and create, again, the risk and injury to the occupants. So challenge is manage everything within the limited space we have and within this very short time duration. So the challenge for engineers is basically limited time and space. Now, some of you will already know, but some of you may wonder, what is the time scale we are talking about? So in our engineering, we don't deal with, obviously not years or days or not even seconds. We deal everything in microsecond and millisecond. So if you look into any high speed crush, for example, 25 kilometers per hour, 40, 50, 60 kilometers per hour. And if you have a collision with a rigid object or a similar object, the whole event is over within 0 0.1 second means we are talking about 100 millisecond only. So 100 millisecond is the entire duration of the event, but we have to do all our job well before that 100. We have to start doing all these things after 10 millisecond because we need enough time to sense, to decide, to deploy, to restrain, and make sure the person or the body comes down to zero velocity within the time and space. So that's, uh, you can set a challenge you deal with, the time and the space. Additionally, we face different challenges with different technologies that we are using. And right now, obviously, you all know about electric vehicle is the buzz of the whole world because we want to get out of the fossil fuel use and try to use the electrification technology. And basically, we are storing very high quantity of energy in a very dense, uh, you can say, medium. So if there is a collision, there is some risk that it can lead to some local explosion up to the secondary effect of fire. And that becomes another challenge for protecting the occupants in the vehicle. And these are some real life incidences shown in the picture. So electric vehicles present those additional challenges in design for crashworthiness, not just for the energy storage, but also the weight of it is a significant factor. For the same size vehicle, if you compare an internal combustion engine vehicle to an electric vehicle, electric vehicle tends to be at least 400 to 500 kilogram heavier. Electric vehicle is nowhere lighter than an internal combustion engine vehicle. Yes, engine and transmissions are deleted. We still need the electric motors to drive the vehicle. And then we need a big battery to store the energy and to interconnect all these things. So as we are adding more of those gadgets, electrical or electromechanical gadgets to the vehicle, vehicle becomes heavier. Now to protect the heavier vehicle, we end up adding more structure to the vehicle. 
So combined effects of all these things, we end up with an electric vehicle, which is much heavier than the uh, gasoline electric vehicle. And as you have seen with our basic mechanics equation, I showed half mv square, m is the mass of the vehicle. Heavier the mass, bigger is the problem. All right, so it's just to give you the background of what goes on in the engineering. We really don't have very robust or well-defined design rules to design the system. For example, if I want to design the structure, how do I design it? It's not just a force divided by area equal to stress, compare the stress against strength. Yes, that's a preliminary equation we can try to use, but we are dealing with a highly nonlinear crush problems. So we need more than that. So in our engineering, as well as in the testing, we use a lot of instrumentation, not just in the dummies, but also in the structure. For example, we can put an accelerometer in the vehicle and measure the deacceleration of the vehicle, what we call the pulse. So if we know some standard pulse, like pulse is nothing but the intensity of the acceleration, then you can use Newton's third law, and we can say mass multiplied by acceleration is some sort of force. So basically, a structure needs to deliver a certain amount of strength, but then at the same time, it needs to keep crushing as well. We cannot just make it too strong, then everything will be drive and driven to the occupant compartment that we cannot let happen. So we'll have to make the structure deliver a certain resistance to deaccelerate the vehicle, but then at the same time, it has to come crumpling or crushing. So this is the engineering challenge, you can say, in a nutshell that I'm trying to present to you here. We do design with thin wall members because if I try to use civil engineering structures like you know heavy duty I columns and beams, so the vehicle will never be driven on the road. So we tend to use very thin wall. So we can use some of the ideas from thin wall buckling equation. Depending on the proportion and material property, we can see what is the buckling strength of a given strip of the metal. Now we can integrate it to a, say, a box section of the thin wall, and we try to approximate what is the initial buckling strength of a member like that with some empirical adjustments. But we are looking for not only just initial buckling strength, we are also looking post buckling, initial buckling to really is sustained resistance over a defer, large deformation span. So we meet, need more than the initial buckling strength. So there are some empirical equations available. Many people did many things over decades and some of my colleagues with me, they also published or developed an equation that I'm just you know, showing to you here. This is more for uh, aluminum extrusion design, basically uniform thickness with standard cross section. And we can use an equation like that to figure out what is the average cross strength of a design. Obviously, this even this equation, it needs a lot more uh, validation. But I said it's empirical because it starts from some basic engineering and then it needs lots of coefficients to adjust to make it work for real life. And now if you try to expand further and you look into the real construction of a vehicle structure, it's not pure simple geometry. We have lots of layers of sheet metals with pretty complex connection procedures and complex geometrical shapes. So many of those analytical or empirical equations basically fall apart when we really come to the real life applications. So what we end up doing is basically finite element simulations for upfront design iterations, to basically work on what we call the built-up structures. Built-up basically, we bring different pieces of sheet metals, we weld and bolt them together to build a vehicle body structure. So here is the whole process. We start with some concept of a de design and we go by basically past design practice and competitive benchmarking. We always look around and see who else is doing what. That's how we set up our initial design. Then we go through the full-blown finite element simulation of the system in different modes, try to optimize and verify to make sure the system will work. And obviously under business competition and pressure, we want to minimize the prototype build and cost for it. So we try to do the critical prototype testing and validation, and then we go for production. Obviously, all those external agencies, they're looking after the regulations and start rating. They will basically take our vehicle, test and prove out what we are saying and selling is really worthy of what they're asking us to do. 
And then based on that learning, we feed back our uh, engineering learning to the next cycle of product engineering. So that's how the whole process works. So what do we need a skill to operate in the profession? We need a very good understanding of the finite element modeling techniques. It's really, really essential to understand all the details. We don't need to write any code. We don't need to write the Fortran program that we all learned in the school or we used to learn in the school. But we need to know the details of the formulation to understand what is applicable in what scenario. That's one part. Then also we need to understand the different construction and manufacturing methods of different parts in the vehicle that we use. Not all parts are thin sheet metal that can be modeled as thin shell elements. So we try to understand the design and manufacturing capacities and try to understand the different designs. Or sometimes we drive a design to say we need certain thickness in certain area, certain thinness in some other area. So then again, the finite element modeling of all these uh, different part configurations becomes a challenge. So that knowledge is also very, very important. Next important thing is the material modeling. We all learn in the schools, elastic, plastic, but it goes much beyond that. that we need to deal with different kinds of materials and we use a lot of metals, aluminum, steel, magnesium, so we need to understand the hardening plasticity behavior of the material and need to understand which theory applies to which scenario. The software will give me all the options, but our engineers need to understand which one to use in what context. And it's just not the elastic and hardening plasticity. We also need to understand when the damage is going to initiate and how far it is going to go. If I don't count for any damage, we are always going to get a highly resistant and design in the structure, in reality, it doesn't really you know, sustain the resistance after a large deformation. So we do need this, um, you can say, advanced understanding of nonlinear modeling technique with damage and fracture simulation. Next important thing is to understand all kinds of mechanical joints we use in the assemblies. We can have some MIG wells, we may have some spot wells, we can have some laser welding, we will have some bolts in the assembly. We will have some what we call the hemming with structural adhesive. We also use structural adhesives in some other interfaces. And then in the mixed metal joints, we have many different mechanical fastening methods, starting from rebating, clinching, to flow drill screws, to SPRs, etc. So not all the joints can be modeled always the same way. We need to understand what is the nature of the joint what can be done in what scenario, and then how to model it. As the parts go through large deformation, their interface conditions change. So part-to-part -part contact interactions change. And there are many different ways to formulate that kind of contact scenario in the software. So we need to understand which works for the crash simulation scenario. Generally, penalty method. Many of you who work in the field will understand it. Oh. That method works <clears throat> better than the other methods, so we tend to use that. Well, the final thing is about dynamic simulation process. Standard dynamics talks about always the implicit method, which is the numerical integration of the finite element equilibrium equations. <coughs> Excuse me. We in the crush, what they design and engineering, we tend to use what we call the explicit method. I don't need to go to the details of it. Some of you will understand it. But basically, this is an integration method that works with the parallel processing in the computers very efficiently, but is not really unconditionally stable. It is only conditionally stable under a certain criteria. And one of that particular criterion is that we need to work with a very, very small time step. So if you are trying to solve a 100 millisecond duration of the event, we will try to go at less than one microsecond, maybe half a microsecond or a quarter microsecond step. So it's a long computational time. But in engineering, we try to set the model and do all these calculations done overnight. So if through the day engineer works on the things, following day we want to see the results and review and discuss and then make the decision for next step. So that's, you can say, our cycle time. 
Global operation helps because if one region of the world is doing certain thing and then at the end of the day, they can transfer it to some other parts of the world to take over and do the rest of the work. Now you can understand that why in global operation, we also have global engineering centers in different parts of the world. So they all can work together to deliver the services that we are looking for. Last but not the least, the most important thing is also to visualize the results thoroughly and nicely. So I'm just going to play a little animation. Again, it's a YouTube video. There's nothing hidden there. So it is not just for entertainment. That's what we do every day. We spend hours and hours looking into different nitty gritty of the vehicle structure. I'm just going through, going through it quickly so I don't have to go through the whole thing. So we'll go and look into each and every part in the critical areas, try to understand what is happening. If anything is not working right, how to modify it. So this is basically the engineering process we go through. You can say every day. Well, last thing for further reference, you can look into my book and I take this uh, liberty or opportunity to make free advertisement for my book. But this is just not a standard finite element book. This is basically a synthesis of my teaching efforts at different universities plus my learning from civil and automotive industry work that I have been involved with over the last many years in America. And this vehicle, uh, sorry, this book is a presentation of my learning over those years of teaching and practicing, highlighting basically the important things that we must keep in our head if you're trying to solve some real engineering problems. That's the end of my presentation. And those who are interested in this field, you can always find me in LinkedIn and you can stay in touch also through emails. And with that, I would like to basically hand it back to Professor Vissas, the chair of these sessions to really lead to the next discussions and conclusions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bhattacharji. Wonderful presentation, uh, was very informative. And uh, I hope the students particularly enjoyed it and uh, they have a much better idea now what goes on in making a car and, and how the crashworthiness is evaluated and what is involved in terms of the engineering skills that are needed to, to be successful there. Uh, at this time, the floor is open. So uh, if you have any question, uh, please, uh, uh, Please let me know, let Dr. Bhattacharji know if you have any question. Any question? May I put in a question? My name is Paul. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Please uh, go ahead. Okay, you have demonstrated in your presentation the various modes in which the experiment is to be conducted frontal, side, the top, and things like that. My question is, uh, when you are designing this uh, crash worthiness experiment, are you, uh, how you are uh, defining the, say, factor of safety type of thing? Sub what I mean, suppose a design is for frontal impact, it should be able to resist, say, 120 kilonewton. And, but when mm -hmm. you are doing that frontal test, so you subjected to how much? I mean, that is the, you may call it factor of safety or the uh, uh, margin of your experimentation. Well, very good question. So factor of safety or margin of safety is built into many different layers. So if, if I look into the end result, end result is after crushing at a given speed target, yeah. we, are, we are measuring the injury risk in the human body models or dummy models. So in those measurements, we will always have some, you can say, safety factor built into it. If the limit is, for example, a femur load must not exceed five kilonewton in a certain mode, yeah. we may design yeah. it to the say 85% of that limit. So, and then we, we try to back calculate and see where do we want to keep a, a fake factor in which cases, because not each measurement has the same uncertainty. Some yeah. of the ones have better repeatability, some ones have less repeatability. Yeah. But in terms of the speed, we go by the standards. And those standards are defined through research. 
with the field data and agencies. So whatever the speed they specify, we go with that. Sometimes in some cases, we may have our internal requirement. An internal requirement may say that this particular mode has high incidences also in the road and it has high visibility on the road. So mm -hmm. if you are going to be tested say at 40 miles per hour, I'm saying miles because that's how America goes, okay, design, okay. It for, design it for 45 miles per hour or 50 mm -hmm. miles per hour. Mm -hmm. So we have those internal uh, guidelines that we also must respect. And then okay, we, so as engineers, yeah, we as engineers also make sure that if we are designing something, we are not just designing an end of it because we are responsible for also when it gets tested and validated by external agency. So we always try to take care of those kinds of uncertainties in measurement going from one test lab to the next test lab to the next test lab. There is a big variation there as well. So you can say we have those layers of safety built in everywhere and we try to do our best. Okay, the, this margin you are talking about, is there a standard or general agreement between the manufacturers or the uh, test houses or it is uh, based on, uh, it differs from manufacturer to manufacturer? I, these are all internal to the manufacturer. Okay. In external agency, when the test, say they are measuring the acceleration in a certain area and that acceleration needs to be 30 G. As long as it is below 30 G, they will say you pass. They don't have any other thing associated with it. Uh -huh. But we want to keep enough margin depending on the uncertainty of this measurement. And we may design it for a lower limit that in spite of the variability for test to test and for design to design, we still want to meet the target. So our requirement will be completely internal. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. This Thank is you. Ochuta. Yes, Ochuta, please. Yeah, yeah, Ochuta, please go ahead. Can I? I was overwhelmed by the amount of data that has been used by Dr. Bhattacharya in his tests, modeling, etc. It's tremendous. And the lecture was, I was just rapt attention, with rapt attention, I was trying to develop his slow, steady statements. But uh, before I go further, I have got a specific question. Before I go further, let me do a little bit of criticism as well. Let us say uh, <laughs> the sheet number 13 and 21. It is all assumed these days that you uh, get hardly any chance of giving a lecture with a large screen 15 feet by 10 feet screen and all things get enlarged. It is all a too virtual. These days it is all virtual. So these sheets I am talking about, 13 and 21, the amount of information, the amount of words in it will fill up a sort of <laughs> full 10 sheet pages. So it is rather difficult uh, for the viewer to appreciate the amount of letters and all in this kind of shit. That is one thing. So much of information is there that Dr. Bhattacharya has to do within a short number of slides. So that is one one sort of my impression. And now the last sentence I'm discussing. I mean, the, the, the composition of a structure it is the, of a car if it is transferred in a structural form, it is absolutely difficult, very difficult modeling. So making uh, mathematical models and satisfying it with APM on mathematical models will be rather impossible, I would say. So I believe uh, that is what I'm going to ask Dr. Bhattacharya, that rather than theoretical impact, I think our practical impact tests give better uh, information to the designers regarding the design of the framework. That's it. Uh, so maybe, thank you, uh, Chudda. Yeah, please go ahead. Yes, so maybe we address only the last part. The first part about the density of information on the slides. I apologize because these are mostly the slides that I use in my classes for one whole semester of the course. 
and here I am doing it in 40 minutes. <laughs> so, so obviously there was a lot of information there. Now coming back to this um, issue of testing, yes. So for certification, particularly for the critical modes, we always rely on the test. And as you have correctly mentioned, modeling all these things mathematically and numerically and predicting this uncertain, you can say it's a very volatile event we are dealing with. Very uncertain, and we try to see some pattern in that with some logic and some structural mechanics there. So prediction is not highly uh, so robust in many scenarios, but in in, also, in many scenarios, we are highly confident some of the things we can predict very well. So it is a combination of engineering knowledge and the simulation results and the testing. We use all these things together to what we call internally sign off a vehicle. As a large manufacturer like ours, we are allowed to sell the vehicle in the market with self-certification. As long as we certify the vehicle saying that it meets the standard, we can sell the vehicle and agency will test it when they have the time and the money. So we take I would say, a great, great deal of time and put a great deal of effort to make sure all our engineering knowledge, all our simulation and all our data are leading to a successful outcome at the end. So it is not just one thing that works for this overall scenario. Obviously, 50 years ago, people used to run hundreds of crash tests and do trial and error to solve the problems. But in the current competitive world, we can't afford to do that. Ideally, we would like to sign up the vehicle with virtual engineering, hoping that everything manufactured will meet the requirement and we can sell the vehicle. But we are not there yet, but every company is pushing to go to that direction. Sir, there is a second part, very small question, along as a subsequent to this. That is, you know, if we want to design a building for a hundred percent seismic, I'm going in relationship with We lost you. Do I am a mechanical with seismic hundred percent? This much of uh, seismic forces and the rest, if it's beyond that, we leave it. So here also, drawing this seminar, you cannot design a vehicle will be 100% accident proof. No. At some stage, we have to say so far, so much, and we leave it at that. So what is the percentage, what is the perception in engineers drawing office on this subject? Okay, uh, uh, unfortunately, we lost uh, part of your audio, but I think I understood the beginning and the end part of your <laughs> question. So with that, I will try to answer the question. So you have correctly mentioned in seismic engineering, we don't design a structure for absolute safety. In fact, there is this, uh, say, 475-year return period of a seismic event when we define the intensity of that earthquake and we design the structure, for example. But that 475 I'm referring to North America, it might be different in India or China and elsewhere. Same goes for automotive structural requirements. When I talked about the speed of impact, like I said, 35 miles per hour or 40 miles per hour impact. So these are defined by the standards. They look into the statistics on the road of the incidences, and then they try to define at what speed of impact they are cover covering the most vulnerable group of people, or the most probable incidences that are happening in the world on the road. Obviously, there will be always incidences that will happen beyond our limit of incidence that we will not be able to provide any protection to, but we will be only provide, providing partial protection. So when they say, say test it at 40 miles per hour or 64 kilometers per hour, we will assume we, the engineers, we don't define those things. Those are defined by the research agencies and government agencies, but we believe that when they define the target, they try to bring the benefit to the most number of affected people on the road. That's Thank you. Thank you, you very sir. much. Thank you. Okay. I want to hear at least one or two questions from the students. There are about 35 to 40 students here. Uh, any question? Any question? It does not have to be really uh, centered around the lecture. But any other question for skills development, graduate studies? Any question? I think somebody put a question in 
Is it? In the chat, I can yeah, see it. In chat box or let me see. Can you can you find it and 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 let, uh, yeah, let something them know? something let was them. something was popping up. Let me see. Yeah. Yes, oh, sir, please. please. It's from Amartya Singh. Uh, I think yeah, one of the students. Uh, please, Amartya, are you there? Uh, if you can please directly put up your question. But, yes, if the scholar is here, he can put the question directly. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Please. Thank you, sir, for the lecture. Sir, I have a doubt. Uh, like uh, in the slide, we have shown like mass is an important factor, mass of the car, because at the impact time, the that entire energy is going to transform in some crumple zones and it need to be absorbed. But sir, uh, in the global NCAP ratings, like majorly the heavy cars are at the top, especially in the Indian market. Like there are many examples. So the heavy cars at the top. So how are actually the weight and safety is related as if heavy cars have more energy, more mass than and kind of it leads to the more deformation and frontal impulsive force on the passengers so they should have like a lower safety but it's not reflected in the global NCP and the actually opposite is happening in the crash test ratings so like how these are calculated and based on the mass okay so mass is a how you say a complex business in crash worthiness uh, starting from the very end um, part of your question like about the global NCAP and their testing. They cannot go and test each and every vehicle for its all different variants because every vehicle comes with different variants and is different masses. Though they try to identify the most sold variant of a product. For example, if you're looking at Ford Focus, for example, then they will ask the manufacturer, how many vehicles are you selling in India? And show me the proportions of different variants you are selling. And then from there, they will try to test the most popularly consume variant in a market. So that's how they will test. If it is for a star rating, but if it is for a regulation compliance, then the company and the regulation agency, they will use the judgment or engineering knowledge to say, which one is the worst case? Is it the lightest variant, the worst case, or the heaviest variant, the worst case? And then they are going to test. Or if they're not sure, they will say, I want the data for the lightest one and the heaviest one, both. And that also happens. So for regulation, every vehicle, no matter what the variation is, must meet the requirement. When it goes to the star rating, then most likely it is always the most popular variant that gets tested. So we engineers, we adapt to, to the uh, requirement of the market. And also sometimes we adapt the design to different mass configuration of the vehicle. Like in the structure, we may say, for the lower end weight vehicles, this is my structural configuration. But for the heavy variant of the vehicle, we may add additional content in the vehicle to make it equally safe. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Is that okay, Amartya? All uh, right, so. Sir. Uh, but there is an India like they most of the time test the lower most variant, like it has the standard safety. So they test the lower variants. And like there are few examples, same segment, same cars with different weight and the more heavier car got better safety ratings and throughout the entire car market. That's, that's a good point you were making. So when I said that for star rating, they choose the most popular variant, with that also what they do, they don't include any optional item. And this is more or less, I would say, a good practice in many markets, and India is using the same practice. Some of the options are there in the vehicle for some particular situation, and these are not offered as standard. So agencies, when they test, they want to test for the minimum configuration of the vehicle. For example, if there are eight airbags for different reason, but there are only four airbags offered as standard, then they will test only the variant with four airbags, because that's the list you can say a number of features in the vehicle and they will want to assess it for that configuration. Obviously, there are optional items offered in different markets for different reasons. Not everything is needed for safety. I can tell you that. One thing everybody must have is a seatbelt. If it is not there, nothing else is going to be too much useful. 
I know there is conversation going on currently in India based on some media reports and etc. How many airbags needs to be there? Whether it should be four or it should be six or eight? These are good points for this discussion, but we need to probably step back and see what is the minimum requirement everybody must meet and what every vehicle user must respect. And it should start with the seatbelt. If you're talking about the vehicle uh, riders, but if you think about other half of the problems are related to two wheelers, I think then we are dealing with a very different problems and we need very different solution. Thank you so Hello. much. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Sorry. Can you can you hear me? Yep. Okay. This is Pradeep Saha from Raleigh, USA, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. now, one question I have. The uh, Dr. Bhattacharya rightfully said that electric vehicle, because of the uh, motors and the uh, batteries, are heavier compared to internal combustion engine cars. So does that mean that electric vehicle may be less safe compared to the current IC engine cars? Well, Mr. Saha, thank you for asking the question. In fact, Omurtyo had a similar, uh, you know, I say, um, mention in his um, question, but I forgot to answer that part. Heavier or lighter doesn't mean that one car is safer than the other. If it is a single vehicle getting into a collision with a rigid object, then obviously heavier vehicle has higher kinetic energy, so it is more challenging for an engineer to make it safe. But if a heavy vehicle is impacted by a light vehicle, then heavier vehicle is safer because yep. it has a lot more inertia and it doesn't get accelerated easily. It is not going to move as much. So depending on the crash mode, heavier vehicle could be safer or could be you know, less, more challenging depending on what is happening. But from engineering point of view, as I already mentioned to over this question, our effort is to make all the products equally safe. We are not going to make a heavier vehicle unsafe and a lighter vehicle safe or vice versa. That's not the business, uh, you know, shrewd decision. Either it is a right engineering or ethical decision. So when we do the engineering, if we always look into the weight, what we call the bandwidth of a product. And if the bandwidth is varying from 2,000 to 3,000 kilograms, we break it down to a segment. And we say, maybe 2,000 to 2,500, we are going to go one design. And 2,500 to 3,000, we are going to have an upgraded design or different design to make sure our performance will be safe. OK. But then for electric vehicle, because the car owner or you uh, do not know what kind of accident uh, the car owner, electric vehicle car owner may experience. So from your point of view, you would like to make it safer for all conditions. Does that pose more engineering problem to an electric vehicle designer? Yes, uh, if you recall what I showed, electric vehicles are heavier. That means they right. come with higher kinetic energy. So we engineers, we already know upfront what we okay. are designing for. Plus, we have this additional challenge of protecting the battery itself. So yeah. we try to do all these things with the best of our knowledge. Regulations are also evolving. So currently, the regulations, they are subjecting the electric vehicles to the same standard as the internal combustion vehicles, plus additional requirement for battery integrity and safety. So we just look into all those regulations and meet all of them. OK. But Thank in, in general, if you're asking the question, is an electric vehicle more safe or less safe compared to an inter, inter, as a internal combustion engine? I would say you don't have to worry about that question. Because the agencies and the engineers, their effort is always to make something equally safe and better. History for safety has been always evolution to make it better and better. It has not gone back in the last 70 years of history that I see in the US for vehicle engineering. OK, I'm in the nuclear safety business, so uh, we also do the same thing. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Any student has any question?
No. Okay. So you have you have the email address. Oh, sorry. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Doctor, what is the area? Yes. This is. Sorry, the, you, did I interrupt anybody? Sorry. Go ahead. I'll I'll back off. Oh yes, come on. The go ahead, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vardhacharya. First thing, my apologies. I really came late because my personal thing. But in any case, following the question my friend Pradeep asked, I'm following the same question in a different format. As an engineer, I'm looking at the problem from two different perspectives. One is obviously looks like you have definitely adequately addressed kinetic energy related to the weight. But from my customer point of view, I've got another concern. Apart from just the vehicular dynamics in terms of impact and weight, all the kinetic energy, etc., my another concern is the source of danger. In my case, I think this way. I have got an IC engine, so my source of danger is if I fuel tank get ignited or damaged, compromised. On the other hand, for electric car, it is the batteries. Now, there are two different sources of danger from my perspective. So while looks like, you know, we have discussed quite a bit about the kinetic energy, I want to know from uh, your design perspective, how do you separate these two different parameters? One is source of is compromised fuel tank. Other is your battery short, shorting or compromise. So is there, to my mind, it's a two different mathematical problem. I'm just asking you your comment on it based on your years of experience. Well, well thank you for asking it. Obviously, I did not um, address this uh, issue here in the presentation because already I had too much information <laughs> to share. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yes, so regulations are also different for internal combustion engine versus the battery electric vehicles. Internal combustion engineering, we have been doing for 100 years. So by now, we, the engineers and manufacturers, we are highly confident that when we put a fuel tank there with these lines and connections to the engines and etc. in the combustion chamber, we deliver it with high confidence that it will not lead to unwanted incidences on the road. In 1950s and 60s, that used to be a common scene on the U.S. highways that if a vehicle got into high-speed rear impact, it used to lead to some kind of secondary fire incidents and etc. It's not a very common scenario. I would say it is not a scenario at all on, on the US roads in today's time. So engineering has learned the lesson, evolved engineering technology so much that we do it with very high confidence. Battery electric vehicle, because it is new and we are learning rapidly at the same time, we are adjusting our engineering process and regulations are also catching up with that. That's the reason I showed one slide here in the presentation with the fire incidents. So again, the, that particular example that I shared here, it did meet all the regulations of the current time, but still it led to some, some kind of incidents on the road. So we are learning those lessons. And even if the regulation is not there, but we as engineering community, we learn from the field incidences, we will be under moral obligation to do some engineering. And I know that particular company that uh, was involved with that incident so that I showed the picture. After some of these incidences, they put additional countermeasure in their products to make it safer for the road. So battery electric vehicle is a new learning and engineering is adjusting to it. So it's still evolving. But if you look for the standards, they are no less stringent from ICE vehicle, they're even more. And engineers are doing the best they can. I always, again, try to bring peace in everybody's mind. Do not think that electric vehicle is less safe because these are newer vehicles. They always include the best understanding of the engineering community. So I will always take a new vehicle as the safest vehicle. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank okay. you for the reassurance. That was very critical. <laughs> because that is one of the things in the PR world going on that, you know, if electric vehicle gets into trouble, and there's a danger. No, that's not necessarily true. But you are right. We are learning. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you very Good much, Kamala. Yeah. All right. 
Okay, Sudeep. so, oh yes, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I will keep it very <laughs> brief. Sudeep, yeah. this is Pranav from Detroit. Yeah. Very good presentation. Mm -hmm. I don't want to go into the details, but I wanted to mention to everyone, I'm very impressed to see so many automotive related presentations. They're all from the Detroit area. Mm -hmm. At least most of them are. Thank you. Thank you, I thank you very much, Pranda. Yeah. <clears throat> to the field. Go ahead. Yes, Dr. Yes, uh, this is regarding the crash test. Uh, in crash test, I believe, I mean, one thing is to gather data on the impact. The other thing is to gather data for the deformation, I think. And when it comes to the deformation um, or absorbing the impact, it's primarily the chassis. If I understand it correctly, the first impact comes to the chassis. Now, uh, you would, uh, um, I mean, you would appreciate when we have two dissimilar chassis, let's say one, uh, one track and, uh, and one uh, passenger vehicle having a dissimilar height. So how uh, how do you take care of that this dissimilar height and then the crash? Because most of the crash studies that, that we see, uh, I, I mean, we see one chassis is just crashing into a wall, stationary wall, uh, or maybe uh, for head-on collision, similar chassis colliding with each other. So how, when two dissimilar chassis comes in contact, things are going to be totally different, I believe. So how that that is taken care of, or is it at all uh, taken care of or not? Well, Dr. Ghosh, you are a good researcher. You always see the gaps in the communication. <laughs> so, very good for asking this question. So obviously, again, my presentation was very simplified version of a long, you know, professional problem that we deal with. Uh, yes, the height of the vehicle, if I have a very low profile vehicle having an impact with a very high profile vehicle, there is this incompatibility between the two. So we don't expect uh, you know, similar kind of engagement and similar kind of reaction in the two. Now to take account of this problem, different countries have those standards that restrict the height of a bumper beam. No matter how high a vehicle is, then they will say a bumper beam must not be higher than this certain height. And this is to ensure some compatibility with the current fleet of vehicles that are operating on the road. So we cannot put a vehicle on the road, which is very high with bumper and is just going to ride over, say my Ford Focus, a low vehicle that is also on the road. So I will be obliged to put my bumper beam at a height no more than the limit so that I will have some engagement with the rest of the vehicles that are there on the road. So at least you have some protection there. It's not perfect, but the countries look into their vehicle fleet and try to define this requirement. Does India have this similar requirement? I don't know because I did not pay attention to that detail. But uh, we do see, for example, when you see one passenger car colliding into uh, another truck from behind, uh, most of the time we find the passenger is going inside the track, the bottom. So obviously uh, the first impact is not really coming on the chassis, rather on the, on the, on the bonnet and the body. You, you, are, you are absolutely right. So again, since I don't know all the details of the U.S. Uh, fleet regulations, but I can uh, tell you from the from my experience, and I'm sure Nihar, the of that they will also tell me this thing. All the trucks on the road. Whenever I first came to you know this part of the world, I was wondering why do they have a hanging bar on the backside of the vehicle? I used to think it is a ladder to climb into the truck, <laughs> but then later, later on I came to realize that you no, know, by regulation, all the trucks that operate on the U.S. Yes. road. They should have a low hanging bumper beam there. So that another car comes from the behind and impacts on it, that bumper beam yes. will give some engagement. Mm, yeah. So yeah. Th that requirement is there. Yeah. Now, if India has it on the road or not, as I said, I really don't know that detail. It is but there you... in India. It is there in yeah. India. What you said that from mm -hmm. the on the back side, it is called uh, rear under carriage protection. Similarly, exactly. from the side, it is side undercarriage protection. So that type of yes. thing is there. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But the, the issue is that do you get really good protection, good engagement between those two dissimilar vehicles? Uh, my answer will be no, we don't get the perfect engagement. But then those agencies who define the requirements, they look into the incidences and they look into the frequency. 
And see, they are always under the obligation to bring the maximum benefit to the most affected people. So if they see that kind of incompatibility is happening, say happening in less than 5% of the cases. Whereas in India, in the slide that I showed, you have about half the death, death happening on, on the two wheelers. Two wheelers. So, so their focus is more on the regulation and safety measures for the most vulnerable group of the people. So if I am the person looking into this presentation tonight from India, immediately I would think probably, let me sell my two wheeler motorbike and maybe I try to buy the cheapest possible car because that is always going to be safer than the two wheeler. Yeah, At least I, I exactly it. thought that way when you showed that slide. Yeah, and then I will worry about the airbag six or eight or four later because my first concern will be I don't want to be hit on the road and thrown on the road with no protection other than a little helmet. But if I'm inside the car, I'm much more secured. That will be the first step. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, so we are almost in 10.55 here, so that will be, <laughs> that will be almost uh, 10 o'clock, yeah. Near the, then give me another opportunity of a couple of minutes. Sure, sure, Thanksgiving. sure. So yes. on, behalf, on behalf of the Department of Mechanical Engineering and also on behalf of the Centenary <laughs> Celebration Committee, let me thank Dr. Shudhi Bhattacharya for this nice presentation here. It's a great one. Must thank you very much for this. And I should also thank our today's chair, Professor Bishash, for sparing his valuable time to host the session, nicely lead the session, and for this wonderful discussion here. I have this uh, mm, uh, nice responsibility of uh, presenting this certificate, the soft copy, as we can um, show here on the screen. This will right. be sending through email. We do have a hard copy and also a memento as a token of appreciation, which we will oh. uh, try to hand over somehow, or we have to deliver it to your place <laughs> to somebody. That's beautiful. That's really yeah. another area we are looking into. So thank you very much. And I should also thank the senior members of the alumni, uh, Achuda, Kamunda. Yeah. Uh, most of them are joining many times, Devi Prashadda. Pranodha also. So thank you very much. Thanks students and scholars and a lot of thanks to my colleagues in the department. So with thanks to everybody, we can now perhaps close the session.